to the last day of the conference here. The first up is Natasha Dabrinian, University of Denver, who will be talking on interdimensional Ellen Thank you. So we're going to begin the morning with Matthias Day continuing. <laughs> So um, I'd really like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's a lovely meeting, and it's a pleasure to be here. So um, yeah, so this is the day after the conference dinner. <laughs> so I thought I'd give a talk talk, and um, hopefully you'll stay interested in the work. And we'll start out with a few sort of um, general, general overview of, of the ideas behind um, this work I'm going to talk about and also the context of where it fits into, so this sort of general scheme of things. And then I'll put in some more specifics because I've given talks on high dimensional Ellen Tuck spaces and some infinite dimensional Ellen Tuck spaces before on um, slides. And I want to make use of this beautiful blackboard. Uh, or a green board that's um, going to allow you hopefully to understand the constructions better than if I were just flipping through slides. So um, yeah, so I also um, am very fortunate that um, Turd Quist and DePrisco and Kanamori and Halbison have already spoken, so they've given you a lot of context and background and definition, so um, hopefully <laughs> you remember everything from their talks. <laughs> and I will um, only put on what's necessary here. So I'm going to be specifically talking about um, a paper which is now finally submitted. So this is infinite dimensional Ellen Tuck spaces. And this is now submitted. And um, the second part of this is and Ramsey classification theorems. OK, um, so the general context for this is Connections between topological Ramsey spaces and ultra filters that have partition properties. Okay, so building on work of Matthias, building on work of Carlson and Simpson, um, Todorovic has this lovely book that came out in 2010 on introduction to Ramsey spaces. And um, part of what I've been working on in recent years is looking at forcings that construct be a forcing or CH or MA or you know some way, um, ultra filters that have partition properties. And um, we were looking in the context of Tukey reducibility. And for some of these examples, um, I and some other collaborators, or I myself, have found um, dense subsets of these partial orderings, which are actually topological Ramsey spaces. And once you have that, you have a lot of machinery at your fingertips to investigate partition relations, um, canonical equivalence relations, and then apply them to find exact Tukey structures below. So the, the context is, is connecting ultrafilters or connections between ultra filters with some partition properties and topological Ramsey spaces. Okay, so in particular, when is a forcing which constructs an ultra filter with partition properties?
essentially a topological Ramsey space. Okay. So that's our context for all this work um, and why we care. So I'm actually going to write down why we care because it's a chalk talk. Right. So there are four general reasons why we care. So the first one is that um, if, um, well, a topological Ramsey space has its versions of the ellen tuck theorem, right, which is an extension of the galvin perkery theorem and the Silver theorem, and so you're getting that all definable with respect to the space subsets have the, have the Ramsey property, right? So th this is really nice to have, really nice to have. So that's number one. Number two, um, you get complete combinatorics. over L of R in the presence of a supercompact cardinal. If you force with the analog of mod finite. Okay. Um, third, you, you lay the foundations for possibly proving canonical equivalence relations on fronts or barriers. And this is like the Pudlock and Riddle theorem. And fourthly, if you have number three, then you have the possibility of applying it to get really concrete, very precise structures in the Tukey types of ultrafilters. So meaning that when you have your forced ultrafilter, you look downwards, you know exactly what the structure is below it. Okay. So if three, then possibly get back to Key and Rudin Kiesler structures below the forced ultra filter. So this is why we care. Um, so this is sort of a, a general program um, that I'm looking into. And um, so the starting point for all of this was the Matthias forcing. And that forces, in, in the process of doing Matthias forcing, you can also break it down into the p-omega mod finite step and then the Matthias using the Ramsey ultrafilter step. So the p-omega mod finite step forces a Ramsey ultrafilter. And um, so, so we have Matthias forcing which is connected with power set omega mod finite forcing which forces a Ramsey ultra filter. <laughs> Right, and connected with Matthias forcing is the Ellen Tuck space, which is really just thinking of the downwards closed subsets with the same heads, finite heads, as being an open set, basic open set. Um, so, yeah, the Ellen Tuck theorem uh, says that whenever you have a subset 
of the Ellen Tuck space, which is really the bare space but with a finer topology. And it is satisfying the property of bare in this topology. Then whenever you have a basic open set, you can find a member in that basic open set with the same um, finite initial segment that then the smaller basic open sets either all in or all out of your sets. Your definable sets are Ramsey. Okay, so there's a more general scheme, but I think I'm just going to say this to you verbally because of um, time so I can actually get to the constructions. Um, so Tudorchevich found, this is probably 2009, I think, um, found a connection between the pudlock riddle theorem and two key types on ultrafilters. And uh, what he did was he noticed that, okay, um, in two key reduction, which I haven't actually defined, I can do that. So use two key above V if and only if there is a function from U to V such that for each filter base B subset of U, its F image is a filter base for B. Okay. And uh, if you have root and Kiesler reducibility, then you have two key reducibility, but not vice versa. It's a, it's a coarser equivalence relation. So he found this connection between the Pudlock Riddle theorem and Ramsey ultrafilters and their two key types and showed that, well, okay, if you have these continuous cofinal maps, which we did from some previous work of ours, um, that you could then take your continuous map. Continuous maps are basically given by finite initial segments, right? If you know every finite initial segment as you're making the image of, of a continuous map on the Cantor space, then you know what its value is going to be, right? So if you look at the first initial segment where your value is not empty, and you take the collection of those, you make a front on the Ellen Tuck space. And now since you took the non-empty ones, you can transfer this function over to a new function on the front that takes the minimal value of the original function on this finite initial segment. And then you transfer your ultrafilter that was two key below the Ramsey to an ultrafilter on this front. So now you have a, a front as a base set. And this new function is a rudin kiesler function on this new ultrafilter on this base set, which is a front. And now if you have the pudlock riddle theorem, you can analyze what, what in the world is this function. It's a rudin kiesler function. And you find out that um, there's only one two key type, so two key types of, of Ramsey ultrafilters are minimal, just like Rudin Kiesler ones are. And moreover, you also find out what exactly is Rudin Kiesler in the structure of this two key type. So it's just the Fubini powers of the Ramsey ultrafilter. So this sets up a, a general scheme for trying to find out initial two key structures of ultrafilters. And, um, and, and so the main points are you need a pudlock riddle theorem. You need something that's like a continuous cofinal map. M more importantly, that it's prescribed by finite initial segments. That's the key. And, and then you have to check that you know, everything works in these new contexts. So, um, so so before the work on the Ellen Tuck spaces, um, I did some work on uh, looking at this sort of schema with Laflamme's forcings um, from his thesis. I looked at this with Dorchevich. And we found um, that you could actually see that there is a densely embedded topological Ramsey space inside of these forcings of Laflamme. So that gave us a whole lovely hierarchy of these ultrafilters where you knew exactly what was Rudin Kiesler below and exactly what's Tukey below. Um, and then in some work with Miharas and Trujillo, um, I did, we, we did 
something analogous, but building a new template for constructing topological Ramsey spaces using um, either products or, if I say, classes that had the Ramsey property. And so this encompassed um, these K arrow, not K plus one arrow ultra filters of Baumgartner and Taylor, so that you can get asymmetric partition relations from a topological Ramsey space, um, these n square constructions of blasts um, where you get nice P points with a diamond shape below them. We could do that in this context. So there's a whole bunch of ultra filters that you can get in this way that were classically forced and then we found out that inside of them there's a topological Ramsey space. You can find all this fine sort of very precise structure inside of them. Okay. So now, power set of omega cross omega, mod fin cross fin. Okay, this forces an ultra filter. I'm going to call it G2 on base set omega cross omega. And this is a non-P point, but it projects down to the Ramsey ultra filter that's forced by power set omega cross omega uh, mod finite. So uh, when I was talking with Blass at some point in time, um, he asked, so what do you think the tricky type of this thing is? How would we find out, um, you know, it's certainly not, at, most certainly not at the bottom, and um, it might give some nice example to what's still an open problem about um, the difference or the sameness of <coughs> Fubini iterates of p-points versus something that's called basically generated, okay? So we did some work on this um, it's in a paper, and Ragavin is a part of this, and showed that this wasn't the bottom, and it wasn't the top, and it wasn't basically generated, so it was sort of a new sort of example, um, and a, a lot of other things in that paper, um, but didn't still know exactly what was too key below it. So I thought, what the heck, you know, I have some experience with these things. Maybe we can get a pseudo topological Ramsey space inside of it, right, and, and sort of do this construction. But to make a very long story short, <laughs> it actually turned out that there is a topological Ramsey space inside. And it actually looks like the Ellen Tuck space omega times. So it's like omega copies of the Ellen Tuck space. So I'm calling it two-dimensional because it's like order type omega to the two. Okay. So yeah, so the scheme, so the scheme is this space over there, yeah general scheme is to take a forcing which gives an ultra filter with some pro pro um, partition properties that you care about and see if you can get a dense topological Ramsey space inside of this forcing and if you can then you can prove hoodlock riddle analogs and prove a continuous maps analog and then you can apply them to get exact Rudin Kiesler and Tukey structures below the ultra filter. Okay. Yeah, forcing, dense. forcing dense, yeah. I mean, technically it's not forcing dense. Technically, below every member of the forcing, you can make a copy of the topological space, which is dense below that member. But it's forcing equivalent. That reason, yeah. Ah, I will tell you. I will tell you, and and more. So fin cross fin 
is the set, and I'm going to do this on omega uh, subsets of omega of size 2, just for reasons that will become very clear very soon. Um, so for all but finitely many uh, i's, a sub i is in fin, where <coughs> a sub i is equal to the set of a's in a, such that the minimum of a is i. Okay. So this looks like here's omega, here's omega, and you've got finitely many places where your set might be infinite, but then after that you have to be bounded or something. Okay. So this is an example of a member of fin cross fin. Okay. And while I'm at it, let's just go up and define the hierarchy of these things, okay, <coughs> because it will be easier that way. So fin cross fin cross fin is now going to be what you think it should be. So it's the set of A's in omega to the 3, such that for all but finitely many I's, A sub I is in fin cross fin. Okay. Well, why stop at 3, right? So you can do this for all <laughs> natural numbers, right? And then what are you going to do? I mean, you could stop. Or you could say, <laughs> I think we do set theory and we can go <laughs> into the countable ordinals. <laughs> There's no reason we should, right? There's the Fubini product construction that just keeps going for all the countable ordinals. So we'll, we will keep doing that. Um, and um, so this brings up the notion of a uniform barrier, which I'll put up first. So, definition. So first I'll define them and then I'll tell you how they look. Okay. So B, a subset of finite subsets of omega is a barrier. Um, if we have two things. So the first thing is that for each infinite subset of omega, there should be a member of your barrier such that it's an initial segment of your infinite set. And then you should have that for all b and c in b, if b is a subset of c, then b should equal c. OK, so that's the notion of a barrier. You've got all these infinite subsets, right? And everything in it has to go through one of these, and exactly one. Um, so a uniform barrier is, is a barrier, but it's nicer, <laughs> uniform. And by a theorem of Galvin, every barrier is uniform on some infinite set. So we can just assume we have uniform barriers to start with. And a uniform barrier, so these are already examples of uniform barriers. So B, uh, so a barrier B is uniform if, and only <coughs> if, um, so for each I, in omega, the set of b's minus i, b and b sub i, meaning i is its minimal member. So it's just uh, that definition. Okay. So if and only if this set is a uniform barrier. On. I plus 1 to omega. Okay. So they look like, so here's some examples. 
Well, this is a uniform barrier. <laughs> Isn't that so interesting? Um, any omega to the k <coughs> is a uniform barrier. Or take your favorite collection of uniform barriers. And shift them up, shift up by 0, shift up by 1, shift up by 2, and, and put them together, and you get another uniform barrier, right? So this is the recursive construction. Given infinitely many uniform barriers, either of the same rank or of increasing rank, and the rank can be defined lexicographically or um, using Cantor, Bendix, and um, derivatives, um, you get from infinitely many <coughs> previous uniform barriers one of either rank that plus one or rank their supremum. Okay, so this construction goes all the way into the transfinite. Uh, well, I suppose you could do that, but I'm only going to do countable transfinite. Um, do you have an example of a non uniform barrier? Yeah, but they're not part of this talk. Okay. <laughs> I mean, just something, mess I mean, simple example, non-uniform barrier by definition, uh, by hurting the definition, if this one had a larger rank, a smaller rank, a larger rank, a smaller rank. Because the definition says the uniform has to either have all the ranks of the ones you used to construct the next step, either all the same rank or strictly increasing. It's a silly example. I didn't see that in the definition. Well, it, it's in the picture definition. It's in the verbal definition. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, another example here, the, the quintessential example of a uniform barrier of infinite rank would be the Schreier barrier. And this is the set of finite Bs such that the size of B equals the minimum of B plus 1. So this looks like here's 0, here's 1, and then a copy of omega to the 1 above 1. So shift up. And then here you would have a copy, but shifted up by 2, and so forth. Okay. So it's the first step of using these sorts of barriers to construct something of infinite rank. Okay. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to now use this to construct our new class of sigma ideals. Okay. So um, given sin bi, where for all i less than omega, and bi, a uniform barrier, uh, yeah. And either all ranks of bi are the same, or ranks are strictly increasing, we're going to define sin to the B, the sets of A subset of B such that for all but finitely many I, the i slice of A is in um, B sub I. Uh, So we're defining a hierarchy of sigma ideals using the structure of uniform barriers to do it. And what is fin to the bi? Fin. Okay. So I'll be precise. So, um, so I'll be very precise, actually. Um, so precisely. Given um, bi <coughs> subset of 
omega to the less than omega such that for all b's, and let's call them c, in b i, i equals minimum of c and the set of c minus i, c in b i is uniform barrier on um, i plus 1 to omega. OK. Um, so given sets, these all have a little s a, a, a one length stem with i. And then above that, it looks like a uniform barrier. And then we're going to glue them together. So then the b is going to be the union of these b i's. And so if you have <coughs> if this whole thing is B, then the fin to the B says I can leave out finitely many of these. And then after some stage I need to be in the fin B I here and the fin B I plus one here and, and so forth. Fin to the bi is just bi is instead of omega. Yeah, so it's on the little tail with the i, and then above it's like, it's it's <coughs> the same as using this, except it has a little stem of i. Okay, so um, let's do a little a few facts here. So, um, so facts. So fin, so here's one. So this fin B is a sigma closed ideal. Okay. So P power set of B mod fin to the B is or contains a dense sigma closed forcing. Okay. And so it forces a generic ultra filter. Which are calling G sub B. So these are generalizing the G2, G3, G4 up now into the countable ordinals. And fourth, if B projects to C, then this gives a Root and Kiesler map from <coughs> GB to GC. Project. So I mean just like knock off some of the top. I mean, actually mean project down. I mean, because if you take a uniform barrier and, and you project, you can, always, you can project to another uniform barrier as long as, well, their ranks are either the same or increasing. So like omega to the k can project to omega l for any l below k. That same sort of process, but in general. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. At least what I've looked at. Right. I'm sure you can do this more generally, but um, yeah. It's a each B there's there's an ordinal rank um, connected with it, which you could use lexicographic rank to do that. Um, there will be different Bs with the same infinite rank that are not the same actual. Um, I mean, because you could you know, go up the evens or go up the odds, right? And they both have rank omega. The the, um, not exactly, no, not, no. 
actually not isomorphic. That's actually what gives you some more infinite structure with these because now you get continuum many ultra filters um, this way, even though you only have omega one ranks. Um, and fifth, oh, okay, so I put four and five together. Oh, all right, and also, so here was B, C, mod fin C embeds complete embedding into B, and B, which is then giving this. Okay. So these, this is the motivation <laughs> for the talk. And now I'm going to start actually giving you some um, exact structures. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we started. Did we start late? <laughs> okay. Um, so here's here's the construction scheme. So this is the construction scheme for the spaces. <coughs> So for the high and infinite dimensional Ellen Peck spaces, which I'm denoting by EB to tell you which barrier it came from. Okay. So we start with the uniform barrier, B, and then we're going to make this um, sequence space, a <coughs> space of non-decreasing sequences. Which I'm going to denote S sub B. I will tell you what this is. <laughs> this is just the general scheme here. Um, uh, legal domains <coughs> DB are set of legal domains. And then there's something, there's maximum member of EB which I'm denoting WB, and then there is the space itself, BB. All right, so what the heck are these things? Well, um, just to sort of cut to the chase, the sequence space is the space of non-decreasing sequences which preserve the structure of B. Okay. So, um, we are going to define a few things to so define a well ordering of omega not down arrow less than omega, which is equal to the set of finite non decreasing sequences. of natural numbers. So it notates what it means. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and we're going to define a well ordering by saying that for S and T, non-decreasing non sequences, S is going to be Prec less than t, if and only if either the max of s is less than the max of t, or their maxes are equal, and s is lexicographically less than t. So the first place where they differ, s is less than t on that coordinate. OK. 
Okay. And now we're going to define a map from B to this. Uh, Sorry? If you extend the sequence, it's greater. Well, it doesn't really matter which one's longer. The length one, of, one, of the sequences one, one, don't matter. So you, if you have like if you have like zero one one two three, and you had zero one two, yeah, yeah, this so one's. Yeah. Right. What about one zero one one two three three? There. Zero one one two three three. Zero one one two three three. Then the then this one's longer because yeah. Yeah. Longer yeah so Lex is including order. yeah okay yeah Lex it's is late including. In the order. Yes. Okay. Because this is initial present. Yeah. Okay, so sigma is going to be our map that takes omega to the less than omega to this space of sequences by just shift down what you need to. So this is going to be A0, A1 minus 1 through AN minus N. So now you've got a non-decreasing sequence from a member of your barrier, and it preserves all the structure of the barrier. So now we have sequences. And now we have this nice order, and it's just a lot easier to handle everything over on the sequence space than the original space. So um, S sub B is going to be this sigma projection of B. Um, B hat is going to equal a um, set of A's such that A's an initial segment of some B. And then we've got S sub B hat, which is what we really wanted. So sigma of A such that A's in B hat. All right. So what if a1 is 0? What if a1 minus 1? Uh, well, but I've got an a0 here. Oh, but the non is 0, 0, 0, 0. Well, this, this is a member of the barrier, so this is just a set. Okay. AIs are strictly increasing. So these are strictly increasing, and now I'm going to get rid of that part of it. Yeah. OK. So um, I am going to now draw some pictures. So here's an example. B equals omega to the 3. Okay. So our sequence space, S sub B, is going to look like 0, 0, 0. So uh, instead of writing a million things, OK, this is supposed to be the sequence 0, 0. This is supposed to be the sequence 0, 0, 0. OK. And then we've got 1. And then we've got, so as I'm drawing, OK, <laughs> This is why I didn't give a slide talk. As I'm drawing, I'm showing you the structure of the space. As I'm drawing, I'm showing you the structure of the members of the space. So how does one create a member of the space in its ordering that you would use to tell me what's the finite approximation map in the topological Ramsey space? Okay, And this is how it's done. So this would have been the first member, and this is the second. And then here's the third, right? And these are in the prec increasing ordering. Here's the fourth. Here's the fifth. Here's the sixth. Okay. So the prec increasing ordering is telling me how I make the members of the space. Um, I'm sorry, this is two. <laughs> uh, all right, and so forth. Okay. Um, so there's, there's a notion of something I'm calling a full approximation map, which is using the spaces of smaller rank to build the spaces of larger rank. Okay. And so a full approximation. And I mean, you've got the finite approximations, right? The first, the second, the third, right? And then by a full approximation, I'm meaning here's your first full approximation. The second one would be this, because the last 
thing you added was free to range over the whole original space. Okay. An approximation to what? This is a this is a larger approximation to, to the to a member of the space. Thinking of a specific member now. Yeah, well, to uh, the one I'm drawing. <laughs> um, so so there's. <coughs> In topological Ramsey spaces, there's always this notion of finite approximation, right? But what I'm saying is that you need a second notion of finite approximation using larger approximations in order to carry the structure of the space from a smaller rank into the construction of a space with a larger rank. So, um, in general, if we used um, the Schreier barrier, Okay, this in the non-decreasing sequence notation will look like this, right? I'm not drawing this in order, um, and so forth, right? And the idea is that above this node, the space looked like Ellen Tuck. And if you chop off at this node, the space looks like the using the barrier omega to the two, right? And in general, if you chop off at the i slice, it should look like the EBI space above, right? So the second notion of approximations that I probably won't put on the board is what really carries the structure over when you're building these spaces recursively. And you really need it for the proofs to go through because otherwise you have no basis for doing the recursion when you're building the larger spaces, right? I mean, so, um, so there's a map that will bring, so this, this B goes to here by sigma. This goes by some psi B that um, orders um, in crack increasing, oh sorry, over to here, orders, so crack increasing order. Um, but what I want to say is that um, if you are going to make a member, another member of the space, right, this is going to be the largest one. Well, if I start here, okay, that was my first approximation. So my second one needs to be here, take something maybe over here. Okay. So this is a full approximation in the new space. And each one here looked like an approximation of the old space. Then we might skip over here, maybe to five. And then you would have to go above five here, maybe seven and maybe up to eight and you would take some larger numbers here and then another one over here and so as you're constructing what's my finite approximate finite approximation map supposed to look like you're going through in this prec increasing ordering but you're also going through in such a way that if you cut off your new member at any first level node, you look like a member of a previous space. Okay. So, um, I'm going to go here. No. I need to go back here. So, if you just label the members of the sequences in increasing order, map that over to the finite subsets of omega, you end up with a smaller subset of, so this is a subset of omega to the less than omega, and the space EB, so I'm calling this map psi sub B, 
And the space EB, so really the pictures I've been showing you are what are the legal domains. And the spaces, the space EB is going to equal the set of psi B's of S such that S is made up constructively of older space, of spaces with lower rank that were used in the construction process. All right. So for each uniform barrier, B, the space <coughs> B subset, uh, the ordering here is just subset because the structure the requirement of the structure to be in the space takes care of what any structure you would have needed on here. So it's, it's just actually subset. Um, so this is a topological Ramsey space. So I'll remind what that means. So IE. For each x, that's the subset of EB, with the property of there. With respect to the Ellen Tuck topology, And for every basic open set, there's going to be a member of this basic open set such that either uy is contained in x or uy intersect x is empty. Okay. And some facts about these. So for each uniform barriers B and C, <coughs> there's going to exist an X in EB. And me, uh, I think that to be a topological empty space means you have to satisfy certain axioms. Uh -huh. um, the, def the actual definition is this. Well, okay, in the proof I went through that you're showing that the axioms are true, yes. Um, I, but technically, it's not known whether there could be a topological Ramsey space that doesn't satisfy the axioms. Right? So, okay, so the short story. Um, yes, I went through the proof, all the A1 through A4 works here, so it is a topological Ramsey space. However, um, it's, uh, it, it, those things imply topological Ramsey space, but it's not known if they're equivalent. Those, those are not the yeah, yes. The about. Right. This yes. is, hey, yeah. I, yeah. yeah. I, I didn't know it. That <laughs> missing four. Oh, sorry. But how did yeah. you define the basic sets? So the basic sets um, are like, um, Yeah. So the basic set, so if we had the purple set here, and let's say we had an initial segment of length three, right? Then everything else that's contained in this purple that extends it, so maybe I lost the purple. Um, you could go, so here's green, here's a member, so you have to, 
be exactly the same as the yellow, and then you have to go into the purple. Ah, there it is. Set after that. So if this was the purple stuff, right, then after that you have to be an actual member of the space, but then taking stuff inside, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, what is U? U is, you, you is some finite, so it's U, U is some member of, 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 of the finite approximations. It's, it's the general definition. Um, only I was using A, because I, I was using A and B for barriers, so I switched this to you. Okay. Um, so facts, a few facts that we'll close with. Um, so why is an EC um, such that EB below X and EC below Y are either equal or one is the projection of the other? So they modulo members of the spaces, they actually form a linear hierarchy. And then um, two, so, well, I, I said that, I'll, I'll just leave that. Okay, so theorem B, Kudlock little analog. This is why this was not part of the title, because I didn't think I'd get to it. Um, but what do I mean exactly? So for each front, so for those who know, you'll know, and those who don't, we can talk later. For each front F on the space EB, okay, so not on omega anymore, but on the actual space, and for each equivalence relation R, on the front, there's going to exist a really nice map from the front to projected subtrees, okay, such that for each u and v in the front below x, u is r equivalent to v if and only if this map takes them to the same thing. Now this is, C of U is a subtree of U, okay, and I finally worked out a, a nicer way to make the map, so it's, it's not just as you go along with the mixing and separating and getting some old nodes that you couldn't get rid of, but you can actually get rid of those sort of placement type nodes at the end that you were using to get the construction of finding this map fee. And then the end, you can um, just say, so what I'm saying is, you, phi of u is a subtree of u. It works, but the way to get there was actually a bit more messy, and then in hindsight, you go back and, and find out that you really only needed the tops of these projections to find out if you were R equivalent or not. Um, and so this, this map is the analog of the Pudlock riddle because if you take some space EB and push down to its first level, that's the Ellentuck space, and this actually gives you back the Pudlock riddle theorem for free there. So it's a hierarchy of generalizations. Then what these are going to do is <coughs> you can apply some of these to um, find your initial Rudin Kiesler and Tukey structures, um, but that's going to be a separate write up. So. Thanks. I think we'll save uh, questions for the coffee break and the next talk will start as soon as we finish. Let's thank Natasha.